Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Greg Squazer. I work with the Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships, co-leading the Sustainable Ag and Food Systems Program. And I am here to host a session today about um, our Farm to Grocery Toolkit here. All right, so um, we are the Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships. We're a program with the University of Minnesota Extension and we typically do this local food college webinar series in the winter time. We fired this one up a month and a half ago, about a month ago or so in response to the COVID outbreak um, as sort of a, a quick way we could get experts and extension folks and farmers who uh, can help other people through this on, um, on the webinar so that we could have a communicative, communicative dialogue about our situation and help people figure out solutions for how to go through this. So um, here we are now, we're about at about the sixth, fifth or sixth in our series. And um, every Tuesday and Thursday, we do this from three to 4.30. And so occasionally um, new ones will get added on. So if you've registered, I think you'll be able to keep up with, uh, we'll, you'll get emails. But so if you're interested in um, keeping up, we'll be doing this about twice a week and we'll see you in the next one too. So today, our two speakers, I uh, will introduce one after the other. So first, we have Kathy Drager. Uh, Kathy is the statewide director of the U of M Extension Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships and an adjunct professor at the De uh, Department of Agronomy and Plant Genetics. As director of the regional partnerships, Kathy leads a multi-college program with one statewide and five regional and community university boards to identify and address community issues of sustainable agriculture and food systems, natural resources, clean energy, and resilient communities across the state. Kathy's areas of research expertise include rural vitality, small and medium-sized farm market opp opportunities, supply chain models, and rural grocery store capacity, and the role in the food system. Kathy is nationally known for her expertise on rural grocery issues and her research on an innovative backhaul model for increasing farmer access to wholesale markets via rural grocery stores which was featured in the University of Minnesota's 2018 Driven to Discover campaign. So we also have Ren Olive. Ren spends their time at work supporting small and medium-sized farmers in rural grocery stores as the Sustainable Agriculture and Food Systems Program Associate for the University of Minnesota Extension's Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships. Working throughout Greater Minnesota, and in addition to working with our SDP, Ren is currently part of a Master of Science program in Natural Resource Science Management at the University of Minnesota College of Food, Agriculture, and Natural Resource Sciences. So that is where I stop and turn this over to Kathy and Ren. <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I did not write that intro for myself. It was really long. Um, I'm Kathy Drager. I'm glad to be talking to you about farm to grocery stores. Um, in addition to working uh, with the University of Minnesota, I also farm with my husband and our three kids in rural Big Stone County, Minnesota which is on the western side of the state. And I just wanted to say welcome to everybody from around the state and beyond. We have a couple people from out of state joining us. And so, so welcome to all of you and thanks for joining us today. Ren, are you gonna advance the slides? All right. So today I'm gonna to take like the first few slides. I'll give you the big picture of what we are working on with this farm to rural grocery work and our rural grocery work in general. Um, but I'm, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about our rural grocery response to COVID-19 because frankly, farm to rural grocery only works if we can keep our grocery stores open and healthy and thriving, which has been something uh, those of us at the regional partnerships have been working on for about 10 years. Ren is going to take over and talk about the farm to grocery toolkit and then our favorite part, which is instead of doing a monologue, we get to answer your questions and have more of a dialogue about this work. So we have been, as I said, working on rural grocery work for about the past 10 years. We were really inspired by the 2010 National Rural Grocery Summit at Kansas State 
Um, and we sent staff there who came home and said, there's some there there. But I'll say that even before that, the regional partnerships, which has five different boards around the community, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, five different boards around the state, um, one in each region of greater Minnesota, that uh, we had rural grocers who served on our boards and helped us be aware of what were the issues that these small town independent grocery stores were facing. Now, if you picture the state of Minnesota, for those of you who live there, I mean, we're, we have about, um, at this time in 2020, we have about 250 small town stores in communities with population 2,500 or less. And um, we'll have a map later that just shows you the location of 70 of those stores. But if you picture a map of Minnesota and you put 250 dots on that outside of communities, outside the metro area, outside of Duluth, um, you know, Rochester, St. Cloud. So think about throughout the greater Minnesota. That's a lot of dots. That is a lot of points of access for communities to have to a full grocery cart of um, healthy food. Those small town stores are really an important part of healthy food access throughout our state. Um, so having worked with them for a number of years, having done some surveys that had a very uh, robust response from the grocers, uh, we had an idea of what issues were being faced. And so we started working on some of these toolkits. Um, well over a month ago, I, I'm, I'm going to say our rural grocery work has four kind of, at this point, four kind of overarching goals, and these are being done in four phases. So the first phase was really thinking, um, we started this about the first week of March, saying, knowing that we were having a pandemic that was starting to spread across the world, what do we need to do to help communities build a little reserve for their vulnerable community members? And one of the ideas that we that came to us was developing this emergency 14 day meal kit, which was something that a community group could purchase, the grocery store could package, and then volunteers, <coughs> excuse me, volunteers could then deliver to um, elderly people who really should be staying, you know, isolated, or if a family happened to, uh, uh, contract COVID-19, it would be a, a grocery kit that could be delivered to that family. Um, and I think I saw Dr. Abby Gold is on this uh, seminar. Hi, Abby. Uh, Dr. Gold was instrumental in helping us take a look at this kit and kind of putting something together with the following criteria. It needed to be food that was available at these rural grocery stores. So we walked up and down the aisles. We took pictures of what was in a, a small town store, making sure it was food that was available, that it was something that a person could prepare if they weren't feeling well. So it wasn't like a bag of raw lentils with a spices. It was, I hate to say, but you know, more, <clears throat> um, it, it was more things that someone could prepare easily if they weren't feeling well or maybe they were elderly and not used to cooking more uh, you know, complicated meals for themselves. We wanted it to be affordable and it was important that everything in those boxes was self shelf stable. Because if a community group ordered, for example, 10 of these 14 day meal kits, um, that might sit in a church for a week or two. We didn't want it to be something that was gonna spoil if a community was going to have these kits on the ready for their community members. So we deployed this meal kit or, and um, it's really taken off around the country, around the state. Um, I received a call from one of the Native Nations earlier this week um, uh, asking if they could reprint this and send it out to the members of their uh, community. And absolutely, yes. But basically it is a simple shopping list with a simple set of basically two meals and a snack a day. And, um, and that is available. People can download that. And we've gotten calls from counties, cities, nonprofits, tribal communities, um, any number of folks who 
uh, I think I think the beauty of this is people just needed a little uh, instruction, and there's a, an actual shopping list in this in this meal kit plan, so that you can just go to the store and pick it up. All right, so that was phase number one. Phase number two was <coughs> a lot of these small town stores have maybe one or two full time workers, and we started hearing some concerns. What if the full-time worker in that store gets sick. Who is going to keep the doors open? Who's going to order food, you know, make that store continue to work? So we went out looking for what models were being successfully deployed by other stores. And then we did very simple one, two, three steps um, on how you could move from being in-store shopping to having a call-in curbside delivery, uh, curbside pickup or delivery option. And we actually modeled this on a store that we watched go through this transition. And so we, um, that was, that is the simple instructions. You can see it on your screen right now, but really saying, how could you do this in a way? And we published that on March 24th. So that's been in the world for almost a month now. And I will just say over the weekend, CNN, um, actually, I, I was interviewed by the, the author of that CNN article, but he didn't, didn't mention our conversation in it. But CNN put out an article saying, is it time that we move to stopping stores from having in-store shopping and go to curbside pickup and delivery in order to keep the grocers safe and limit community spread through shoppers? Now, I, I think it's an and situation. I think there's some stores where the traffic is light enough that it's really not an issue, but maybe if you only have one full-time employee, um, you know, maybe you need to think, what can I do to keep that employee safe? And maybe that is transitioning. And I think there's all sorts of creative ideas in the world, how you can do this. This is just one way to do that. So phase three is what you are on, what you signed up for today. And I'm sorry, it's 317 already. So I will, I will speed it up. But phase three is, Okay, we built a little reserve in our community with, with, the two, with the emergency food kits. We are working to keep our grocers safe the, as individuals, safe and healthy and keep the stores running. Phase three is what do we need to do to be prepared to stock the shelves and how can we use this to the advantage of our, our farm community um, and providing a farm to rural grocery toolkit. And so this toolkit basically, uh, Ren will go into much more detail, but this is what, if a farmer is producing shell eggs or popcorn or produce or a meat product or any number of different products, how, what do we need to do to go from farm to grocery? And it's really just a, a nice way to connect within your community. We've got a dispersed number of stores around the state. Even my county with a population of 5,000 people has three rural grocery stores and I think all three of those stores do carry some farm, um, local farm produce and products in that store. So you can see that even in a more sparsely populated area, there's still multiple opportunities sometimes for a farmer to connect with their small town grocer. Phase four, <clears throat> which we really won't be talking about today, but we really hope to continue to work on this, is the backhaul project, which we really think of as a bi-directional food supply chain. For those of you who've shopped in small town stores, um, you know, sometimes these small town stores are the last stop on a global supply chain, right? Like you get your apples from New Zealand and they are in the grocery store on the shelf. And that's like the last stop in a global food supply chain. But what if we looked at these stores as the first stop on a local and regional supply chain. In other words, if you have a, you know, a number of acres of carrots, maybe those carrots, in addition to being sold at the grocery store, if you have enough of those carrots that it would be um, valuable, they could be uh, transported back to the wholesaler via the same distribution model that is taking those groceries to the store. So the wholesale truck comes into your grocery store, it unloads, those trucks already have a dry good compartment, a refrigerator compartment, a freezer compartment on those trucks. And there might be an opportunity to unload product for a small town grocery store 
and then restock that exact same truck with a local food product, which can then go back to the wholesaler and redistribute it. I actually see that as building a lot of resilience. It's an opportunity to build a lot of resilience into, um, into our food supply. And as someone, Bonnie just noted, that, that reduces those food miles. This is a really, could be a very good efficient way. Instead of having 80 farmers drive to that wholesale place on the edge of the Twin Cities, what if you just go to your closest grocery store, which maybe is less than 15 miles away, and then you load it directly onto the truck. So yeah, it saves those miles. And one of the wholesalers we worked with, oh, I, wish I, I wish I'd written this down, but I think he said their trucks traveled like 25,000 miles a week, over 20,000 of which were empty, right? So, and you've already got the routes in place, the stops in place. So we've got a lot of assets. So I think what's encouraging about this work we're doing with these rural grocery stores is we are really looking at them as important assets in the food system in your area. And so um, when I moved to Big Stone County um, 12 years ago from St. Paul, I had always shopped at co-ops and farmers markets and was really shocked to start shopping in a rural grocery store. Um, but I made a commitment to that store and that store's made a commitment to me too. So like today, they ordered in organic milk for my family and um, you know, we can get the products that we want and need because we've developed a relationship with that store. We give them our grocery business. They accommodate our food needs. And we can see this a lot in these small town stores. They might have limited supply compared to like the Mississippi market in the Twin Cities. But if I work with my grocer, I can still have access to all the healthy food that, that I would like. I think, Rem, that it's your turn to take over. And we welcome any of your thoughts or questions. Please feel free to put anything in the chat. All right, thanks, Kathy. Can you hear me okay? Perfect. I can. So I will be going over our the Farm to Grocery Toolkit, um, kind of part of the, the phase three that Kathy talked about. And I'll be briefly going over some of the sections, going into a little bit more depth in some of the other sections. But overall, here are the eight main sections of the toolkit. Um, this was made possible um, by different partnerships. Initially, the kind of concept for this toolkit was developed before I started working with the partnerships, I want to say back in 2016, um, 2017. And um, that was with MISA, the Minnesota Institute for Sustainable Agriculture. And I think I saw Jane Jewett on the call. Um, Jane was instrumental in, in starting this project along with Karen Lanthier, who now works with Minnesota Department of Ag and Minnesota Grown. Um, and multiple people since then have, have put their hands into the project. Um, and we now have a partner, the Sustainable Farming Association, um, who's helping us to deploy it and to connect with farmers around the state. Um, and then also we're currently working on a specialty crop block grant, uh, which I'll talk a little bit more later. So let's jump in. First, um, before I do that though, I wanna let you know how to find it. Uh, there's a Z link, the z.umn.edu slash farm, the number two grocery. And um, on that page, you can either click on the picture or right below um, it says view or download file. So I just wanna let you know how to get it. It's free. Um, it might, so depending on your internet speed, it might take a little longer to download, but um, it's there and available. So why farm to grocery, especially now? Um, we, when working on this project um, and the specialty crop block grant, which we are working on for the next at least year, um, we adjusted our timeline uh, to kind of speed it up a little bit um, because there's uncertainty in supply chains currently. Um, and we've, you know, the, the, you turn on the news and food is the topic of the hour, <laughs> as Kathy was talking about earlier. Um, and we thought, especially with farmers um, losing different accounts, that this might be a really pertinent time to access this toolkit and to think about potentially doing grocery sales. Um, and depending upon the farmer size, fitting that with um, small town stores in particular. Um, so potential benefits for farmers there's more regularity in purchase volumes and um, that can be established ahead of time because grocers know year to year what their um, product orders are and a lot, well, some of them don't have as detailed, um, but others do. They have different technology to track those scales or those sales. Um, they, the ability to grow overall sales in addition to other markets that you're currently selling to. 
um, looking at different, like the time that you commit to it, um, you're dropping off and connecting with the, the grocer, um, but you're not sitting at a farmer's market for five, six, seven hours. Um, so considering that could be a potential benefit. Um, looking at different outreach that can be made and reaching a different audience. Uh, people go to the grocery store for all kinds of needs um, and local foods should be one of those center needs. And so that's a great way to market your farm. Um, looking at access to a larger customer base and um, a lot of grocery stores that we surveyed and worked with, which I'll get to in a, in a few slides, um, really uh, want to work with more farmers. And I think it's largely an untapped market. Potential challenges exist as well. Um, there's a, a desire for perfect produce that's because it's often consumer driven. And when consumers go into the store, they touch every pepper and find the one without any blemishes. Um, well, there's different campaigns going on, you know, like ugly produce and things like that. So I think that there's starting to become more of a change as, as consumers are more aware of what it means to get produce on the shelf or different farm products. Um, but that could be a, t a potential challenge. The different uh, communication that's needed to, to communicate and connect with the grocer, uh, different price determination, negotiating and working through that might be a new thing for some farmers. And the, there's also an expectation for a different, potentially different type of invoicing system. And looking at knowing in advance as, or giving an advance notice when produce isn't able to be delivered. And also looking at schedules and coordinating that with the grocer versus just using your farm stand or knowing the farmer's market is every Saturday. So here's um, the tiers of the food system. This comes from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And um, we're really looking at um, kind of tier two mostly. So you go from tier zero, uh, personal production of food, expanding that to looking at direct to consumers. So like I mentioned, farmers markets or farm stands, CSAs would also fit in there. And then um, tier two is really more the strategic partners. So we're not looking at necessarily the high bees or the cubs on, on to that scale, although parts of this toolkit could be used um, for that, certainly. Uh, but we're really looking at, you know, that tier two level uh, with the use of this toolkit. So this toolkit also responds to the rural grocery store survey that we've worked on. A, diff a, a, a pretty sizable team of people uh, have update, updated uh, the 2015 survey and added a few more questions. Um, in 2015, there was a similar size, similar response rate. Uh, here you have the statistics for the 2019 survey. Um, it was 20 pages, 80 questions. It was a high ask for grocers, uh, especially when a lot of them have small staff to run their store. They're probably the, usually the ones running <laughs> in the store all day long. Um, but we had a 55% response rate. Um, and with that, one of the questions that we asked was have you turned away any farmer selling locally grown and or processed foods because you were uncertain about the regulations for purchasing food directly from farmers? And so this question, I mean, out of the 80 questions really relates to the importance of this toolkit in the legality section um, because 29% of the, the, the grocers who answered said that they had turned away farmers. Um, another 22% hadn't even been approached by farmers and then 45 percent uh, do purchase from local farmers so I think that that gives us um, you know, shows us the potential to connect with these farmers um, and especially address that legality um, issue of, of farmers being turned away so in response the second section of the toolkit is called legality and method uh, and this is a tool for both farmers and grocers and it's something that um, it, there's a lot of resources in it and links um, and also like statute, Minnesota statute to refer to. Um, some of the highlights are looking at what does the product of a farm mean? Uh, what about adding off farm ingredients or different like a Minnesota food handler license? And also really impressing upon the importance of food safety in, in making sure we have a robust local food system that's accessible through our grocery stores. The different products that are covered, the local foods in this section, um, are fresh produce, meat and poultry, eggs, gra grains and dry beans, dairy, and uh, bakery. Um, and so there's a page on each of these that goes into detail for that product. And 
for our limited time, I'm not going to go into detail of each product, um, but really rather want to let you know how to find that information. Um, and I should mention too, we'll, we, we plan on hosting workshops, which I'll talk a little more about, um, and where we will go into depth on the, the, you know, the legality method of each of those types, depending upon who shows up. But for this purpose, I'll keep it broad. So the third section is the legal product checklist. And this is really one of those tool parts of the toolkit. Um, there's actually spaces, these are just a couple of the pages that are part of the, sec the section, with spaces to actually check off with the grocer um, and farmer, both, like to review uh, what kind of license is needed, depending upon the level of product or the type of product. And again, it goes through those different categories, the produce, dairy, um, et cetera. Um, and then there's also a place to sign off um, to say I you know, acknowledge and affirm my responses. Um, and it's just kind of a way um, for the, the questions that, that grocers have in terms of turning away farmers, if the farmer can say, actually, I don't need a license because, or I have this license because, um, is really just a way to strengthen that relationship and that trust. With the survey, the Rural Grocery Store Survey, we also sent out this comment card. Uh, and it was a way for, for grocers to connect with the U of M and other partners um, to have more of a reciprocal relationship to this massive survey that, of, and asking of the grocer's time for them also to access different resources that are available. Um, and one of those questions that they could check was number 48, as you can see in the red box. I would like help connecting with local farmers to buy products, fruit and vegetables, meat and cheese, or other local food items for my store. Uh, and 58% of the people who sent the cards back in um, said that they wanted to connect. And we were able to get their contact information. Uh, and again, these are stores that are in populations less than 2,500. Um, and they're the stores that we found through various means, um, collected their addresses on and sent them the, the survey and they're the ones that answered. So all these red dots around the state are grocers that are interested and want help buying from farmers. So I think this is really promising and exciting. Um, and this is what the specialty crop block grant um, that we have from the Minnesota Department of Ag that we're working with the Sustainable Farming Association on. Uh, we want to do more work and this is kind of a starting point for us uh, to ma start making those connections. So the fourth section of the toolkit is building a strong business relationship. Um, and different conversations I've had with um, farmers, uh, this is something that comes up quite a bit about what are the expectations, um, you know, what do I, how do I approach, what do we talk about, um, and on the grocer's side, they're kind of very used to different, um, uh, different uh, vendors coming into their store, you know, on a pretty regular basis, um, so we really wanted to provide a resource for farmers and also grocers to help ease this relationship. Um, communication is key, and the toolkit covers purchasing, communication, quality, display, shrink, or waste, and then also different considerations for pricing, explaining what margins are, a margin calculator, um, looking at packaging options, and then also exploring different pathways for sale. So dry, bu direct buying from farmers, uh, renting shelf space, and consignment as well. Um, and we also talk, feature, you know, the resources through Minnesota Grown that are low cost or free uh, with membership and available to grocers and farmers as well. So here's what that section looks like. Again, this is more of a tool part of the toolkit with space to write in on the page as you, to take notes as you kind of go through these different um, topics and discussion. The goal is to have the conversation uh, in the store with between the farmer and the grocer. Um, so purchasing is the first ca like category covered, considering different price types of product, um, how much, some of those more basic questions. Um, the invoicing piece, rem you know, rem remembering to ask that question, does the grocer do it in a, per in a particular way or uh, does the farmer already have a, an invoice that will, will that work for the store? Um, and then also how is the negotiation over price going to happen? And just kind of thinking about that and saying it out loud. Um, to avoid um, confusion and or frustration. Communication then, um, so how frequently would the store need new orders to be ready? How will the farmer and store communicate about purchasing new orders? Will there be texts? Do you have the grocer's 
you know, a text number or the, does the grocery have the farmer's text um, or is email preferred or phone calls? And then how soon does the store need to know about product shortages? Quality is the next category. Um, discussing packaging and presentation, looking at different sizes, what, is, um, what do the consumers expect? Uh, how is the product packaged? Um, are there different industry sizes that the grocer would prefer? Uh, and then also what happens to, um, will the store ref ever refuse product or reject product? Um, and what, what does that like mean? Or what are those uh, specifications? Then display, uh, what space does the store have available to allocate to the farmer's product? So looking at, you know, does it need specific refrigeration temperature? Um, we also link to the produce handling toolkit for this one. And that's a whole different toolkit that our, the regional sustainable development partnerships and partners uh, worked on um, that can help with look, some of those considerations in terms of handling produce. Um, but in this conversation, always also talking or, or thinking about bright light, is it humid? Um, how does that change throughout the day or week or weather dependent? Um, so having that conversation as well. Also looking at promotion to customers. And then finally shrink um, or waste. How frequently will grocery staff look over the produce and call it? Um, what sorts of factors will cause, cause the store to call it or to take it off the shelf? Um, and then where is it going? Is it gonna be discarded, donated, or given back to the farm? So those are just topics to guide the conversation uh, between the farmer and grocer. The next section is the farm feature template. Um, and this is downloadable. It's just a kind of a simple, easy um, suggestion or kind of prompt uh, to really put the farm out front and to, to show customers what, how important it is um, and, what, and that the groceries store is offering those products and that we have a local food system. Um, so that's that one. <laughs> Processing for sale is the sixth section. So why process local foods? Um, the section kind of talks about the broader market reach that's possible, different consumers with specific needs, uh, especially, for example, um, elderly population where cutting squash might be um, a challenge. So they, having an option to have cut squash would be great. Um, also looking at the potential to lower food waste. Waste. So looking at you know different um, like even frozen options that might be possible um, or preserved. So produce, and then also with the, the lower food waste, you're able to use the, the less than perfect different farm products with that. Um, so produce um, for processing for sale, the, the toolkit goes into depth on the key for license um, for this is looking at adding off farm ingredients or using produce that are, is acquired from other farms. Um, and again, I'm not gonna, we can we will go into depth with workshops between farmers and grocers, but in this context, just highlighting the section. Uh, also, again, food safety. So looking at the facility that processing is happening in, um, that is adequately equipped to meet uh, current good manufacturing practices and that, that it cannot be a home kitchen, for example. And then uh, f looking at other farm product beyond produce, um, what is the process or manufacturer um, and the license for that? Um, how do you find out that information is also included. Um, and then looking at the, the, what do you do? So you have to use a commercial grade kitchen space that is approved by, approved by Minnesota Department of Agriculture Inspector. We also provide the link to the commercial kitchen guide and that may be of interest. Um, and that's been out for a number of years, um, but a really good resource that's related to processing local foods for sale. So Ren, can I uh, jump yeah. in for a second, give you the, give the chance to answer some of these questions. So a few oh, sure. questions Sorry. Been yes. coming in through the chat and we've been kind of responding um, in the chat, but it's I think a good opportunity to um, hear it uh, from us uh, out loud too. Uh, one of them was uh, someone up in Duluth is looking at the map of grocery stores and wondering why there are so few in the area in the Arrowhead. Um, was it that there are not that many existing stores or weren't able to reach out or there's a low response rate or, or what? I mean, do you have anything specific, specific ideas for the Northeast part of the state, why there were so few stores? Yeah, so this one, so that's the picture of the map. I can back up a little bit. Um, that one was of stores who wanted help connecting to farmers. So that wasn't all the stores that were surveyed. Those are just the ones that filled out that comment card. 
Um, they're we, only, we only surveyed communities of 2,500 or less. So it didn't go to Moose Lake or Ely or Duluth, Grand Rapids, some of those communities. Simply, we, that's, that's not the scale we're working at. We're working more on the small town scale. So it excluded some of those larger communities as well. All right. Um, so let's see, what else do we have here? To, to asparagus, yes, this is a good opportunity. Asparagus, let's see, we got to scroll back up for the question here. Teresa, what would you, it's something about testing asparagus. Oh, asp asparagus is one of the first crops out of the fields and a lot of people have lost their markets with restaurant closures. Are rural grocers interested in seasonal supplies of asparagus right now, do you think? I mean, I think it's worth asking and, and reaching out to them. Uh, they currently have asparagus because as the crop uh, comes in in the south, it continues to be sold in, you know, across the supply chain up into the north. So I know there is asparagus in rural grocery stores right now. Um, at least there was a couple weeks ago. And so, um, but I still think the local, you know, put the Minnesota grown label and, and test it with with some of our grocers is is a good idea. So, and someone asked um, too about our grocers trying to be more nimble and flexible to take on super small growers, especially new and emerging producers. So uh, my thought would be, as you're building those relationships, if you've never met your grocer, never walked into their store, you know, you wanna buy, I have a friend who literally brings coolers with her to the cities and stocks up all her food and then drives it back out to the country. Like if you wouldn't, if you don't have any relationship and you walk in and say, buy my food, they may not be as receptive. But if you're someone who does get to know your community and your grocer, then I would say, you know, there's a good chance that the grocer will want to work with you as another, you know, business person in the community, another community member. Um, so I think, I know one of the first sections in the toolkit is about, or is about building those relationships. So I think that is part of it. I think we also have to consider the, the risk that the grocer is taking. Um, if someone comes in and wants to sell arugula and that grocer has never sold arugula and someone comes in with a bushel of it, you know, the grocer is gonna say, I don't know about this crop. I'm not sure it would sell. So I think um, there's also a section here about um, business, business models. And, you know, you might need to sell some of the first time you sell food to a small town grocery store, say, I will do this on consignment. I think your customers would like arugula and I'm going to put on my Facebook page that they can get a organic arugula on Main Street, Hancock, Minnesota or something. Um, and then, uh, but you could say, but if it doesn't sell, um, I, you know, I will sell it on consignment. So you pay me for what sells in the grocery store and let me know after three, four or five days, if none of it has sold and you weren't, you know, you as a farmer weren't able to generate any word of mouth, like, hey, you wanted our organic arugula? You can find it now here and here and here. Um, so I think there's a shared responsibility for that risk between the farmer and the grocer because these grocers work on extremely, extremely thin margins. And um, so that's why um, I, I have seen the consignment. So I saw Melissa said um, about her local grocery store does not have a misting system. So everything, this is the other thing I've seen, Melissa, in a grocery store is they'll put a sign up. They don't have a misting system, but it says, if you want celery, ask me. I will get it out of the back cooler where it, it, it's in better shape and quality because it's not one of those open air coolers. So some small town groceries use a system like that. Um, and yes, I've seen that consignment model work. Um, the, one of the stores um, had commodity eggs for like a buck 25 and a dozen and a, and a farmer said, I would like to sell my free range farm fresh eggs for three twenty five a dozen. And the grocer said, I, I don't know if our community will pick your brown eggs for three twenty five over our white eggs for a buck twenty five. And so the farmer said, well, put, you know, put 20 dozen in the cooler case. 
what sells you pay me for, what doesn't, I will take back home. And um, over time, that store actually built up a following so that people would call and say, do you have farm fresh eggs today? What day are you expecting those? Um, and people were willing to pay um, double for uh, that farm fresh product. So, but the grocer doesn't know that. And are they really gonna take a risk on spending $60 on eggs, which maybe no one will buy? So I think a consignment model is a good faith way for small farmers to build that relationship with the grocer um, and share the risk that the grocer might be taking by putting something that hasn't been in their store in their store. Here's another question for the both of you that was uh, further up in the <laughs> chat stream, but um, how are we all collaborating with um, and consulting with our tribal communities? Uh, so I did respond in the chat group that we yep. have five boards around the state and we have uh, uh, Native Nation, members from our Native Nations on uh, most of our boards around the state. So we do have, you know, some good lines of communication um, but we are always open to more collaborative relationships. So um, if we, we would be more than happy and, we'll, and are doing outreach um, as part of our specialty crop grant, and that will include outreach to our, uh, the Native nations that we share our geography with. Ren, did you have anything else on that? You're nope. really gonna be. Yeah, that, that's what I would, would say as well. I can say with our the ready response um, with the rural groceries, we have um, worked with them with getting the curbside um, and that that grant that's going on right now with the curbside setup. So we've been working in the Northwest with with some of the native uh, communities on that. Great. Any other questions? Um, here's another one that uh, showed up now that I think of it. I've loved uh, seeing creative stuff like a rural co-op opening up the fridge space for food hubs and online farmers markets with uh, small producers taking on small producers versus taking on small producers in the store. So, nice. Yeah, some of the grocery stores um, also the independent stores offer their parking lots for farmers markets as well. So definitely is willingness to be creative. All right. So I just have well, a couple thanks for letting more. us jump in and, and pry a bunch of question answers to questions in the middle of your. Of no, your, it's all good. Um, it's all good. Uh, if everybody yeah. um, wants, if I, if there's anything we missed, please uh, feel free to copy and paste it down at the bottom again, and we'll get back to questions again later on. Yeah, I just have a couple more slides. Um, so the the seventh um, section of the the toolkit goes into product or sample product labels and what that might look like, what should be included. Um, looking at again those the product categories the produce meat eggs etc grains um, then there's a section on invoice templates so what are the different parts of an invoice what do they mean this is more basic um, so intended for a, a farmer um, who may have not worked with creating an invoice there's also a template to download and adapt on your own to use um, available with this section so um, with that, we're looking at what's next. So here's that map again of the groceries who want help connecting with farmers. And these are the less than 2,500 people who answered the survey and the comment card. So we'll start with their contact information, working with um, st strategic partners around the state. And we are also always open for suggestions on ways to do that. <laughs> and we have a, a pretty good group of people um, on this grant working on that as well, which includes farmers and grocers. Um, we're also looking at creating a next version of this toolkit because we, as we have conversations um, and that we get some feedback, there might be saying, you know, we might get something that says, oh, there's a gap in this, or I would really like to know this information, or is this legal? Are those kind of questions that we're going to be collecting over the next year uh, to update to a version two. And so with that, we can ask, take on some more questions. I think we have at least a half hour left, it looks like, um, for questions or comments or ideas. All right, so uh, do rural groceries do sampling? I've never seen that around here. I think, I think yes, the answer is yes, but I think that's something you need to uh, arrange. I don't think it's, it's not an organized effort like at 
London Byerly's, for example. Um, but I have seen um, grocery stores do, I have seen some of the small town stores do some sampling, but, uh, and I think there would be opportunity that if a farmer said, I've got really good watermelon and people will want to buy it if I can give out samples that a grocer would probably say, bring it on and put it on Facebook and tell your friends. So they might even welcome something like that as something, if you just have one full-time employee in your grocery store and then, you know, the high schoolers who come in after school and on weekends, you might be really grateful if a farmer asked you uh, to allow some sampling. And I'm pretty sure that's allowed. I'm making sure. I think that the regulations would allow for sampling. We had, we've had this question before. But that might be something we can add, Ren, to version two, sampling. All right, who do you see facilitating the conversation on backhauling? Uh, do you have any examples of a profitable model being used? Uh, and, and thank you to Jane, who is my go-to person. If Jane Jewett says it's so, it is so. And Jane says, yes, sampling in grocery stores is legal. It's done under the grocery store's license. Um, and then uh, that question about, did you just read the question about facilitating the backhaul? Yeah. Greg? Yeah. Who do you see facilitating the conversation on backhauling? So the regional partnerships have basically been convening um, researchers, students, grocers, wholesalers, farmers around this topic. And uh, we started with a crop of garlic and we've actually done backhaul. So we've worked through the regulations, check, that's done. We've worked through the logistics, check, we've done it. Um, garlic, um, we use that because it's shelf stable, it's a low food safety crop and it's high value and it's kind of compact. So it's not like if we started with watermelons, you know, which are giant and need to be refrigerated and need to be sold before they, you know, in a certain time period. Um, but we also found that that was enough of a niche crop and that the direct to consumer market was high enough that our garlic at $7 a pound was not competitive with Chinese garlic at 79 cents a clove. So, um, so we still are struggling with how we balance the consumer demand for a crop like garlic, which there's a night and day difference if you're a foodie between the garlic from China and the garlic from, you know, a local garlic grower. Um, so we're still trying to balance out the, the what crops are going to work well and how we can do this. But we know we've checked a few things off the list. Um, as far as will it work? Is it in, in its feasibility? So I would say the partnerships are um, really trying to continue and host that conversation around the backhauling. And I think this, this might be, you know, as we, as our food supply chains, as we're seeing with meat and other things, as our food supply chains are in for a little bit of a shock from COVID-19, um, that might be a time to have more open conversations about, you know, um, our cheap food policy and uh, more efficient ways of building these regional and local food systems, which I think back hauling would fit really well into. All right, so a note here um, that although um, sampling in a grocery store or a farmer's market is legal, it's not legal right now. So that was ju just to clarify um, that under the current situation, nobody's gonna be doing food sampling, but typically it's something that a grocery store can do with their license. Um, all right, another question here. What is the range of invoicing systems? Can you provide any examples? So the toolkit looks more just uh, like, you, what does the paperwork look like, the actual invoice itself? Um, we don't go into depth on like electronic or some of the, those other tools that are available, but that has my wheels turning and I think is a really great suggestion to add. <laughs> Okay, so anybody else with questions, please feel free to type them in on the chat. 
And, and these are all really super good suggestions. And, you know, we really did fast track getting this toolkit out, even though we've been working on it for a while. But we wanted, in light of what's going on with the COVID-19, with the pandemic, we really wanted to get this concept and these little tools out in the world. And so that's why it's super helpful to hear your suggestions. And we will definitely be thinking of how we can, um, you know, what version 2.0 might look like. Okay, here's another one. Uh, this discussion reminds me of the Seward Co-op's Community Foods Program, where stores promoting small, local, cooperative, inclusive, sustainable producers, so people see the value in the regional, see it as an investment too, that goes beyond the price tag. Yeah. Anything else? Anyone else? All right. Well, um, if there are no more up here, here we go. Would this toolkit fit with independent grocery stores in more urban areas as well? Great question. I think so. Yeah. Yes. I think that the, the size, like look, thinking about the size of the store um, is what's key in the toolkit and we initially were calling it farm to rural grocery toolkit um, but with, because the, the law is the law it <laughs> doesn't matter if the store is located in um, you know greater Minnesota or the metro area um, we expanded it to farm to grocery um, so yeah definitely I think it could work urban areas. Okay. Well, our contact information is on the slide and um, in the toolkit as well, there's ways to connect. Um, the RSDP's website has all of our contact information. Uh, so please just reach out as well beyond okay, this yeah. webinar. Um, upcoming sessions, it's April 23rd. We'll be talking about employment concerns on small farms. April 28th, Farm to School, and on April 30th, we'll be talking about cultural diversity in the local food systems and responding to discrimination in markets. So things you can do if you registered and you saw this uh, session, you'll be getting a, um, oh, what's, you can, hmm, sorry about that, hold on. If, so you can go to Facebook, facebook.com backslash groups backslash local foods college, and uh, you can share this with other people. You can see uh, what we have up there. You can tweet Local Foods College at RSDP at UMN Small Farms. Um, you can join us on Thursday for the Employment's Concern, Employment Concerns on Small Farms, and uh, keep up with what we're doing. So thank you very much. As I was about to mention earlier, um, you will get a, um, a an email from us with a request to do a little survey about what you thought. So please go ahead and take that survey. And with that, I think we will be done. Thanks, everybody.